the strategy is to build up a silver vault in the ground. And in the future, I think we'll get we'll get properly valued for for those ounces. Is the world running out of silver? Where will the supplies of silver come from in the future to meet the projected demand increase? Are certain companies strategically placing themselves into a spot where they could benefit from this coming surge in demand in silver? Today, we're fortunate to be joined by Sean Kuhn Kuhn. He is the CEO of Dolly Varden Silver. Sean, welcome to Ron's Basement. Ron, thanks for having me on. Well, you're 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 welcome here, and on behalf of all of our viewers, we'll uh, we'll look forward to hearing from you about your company and and also your thoughts in general about the silver market and where things are heading. Um, do you have any just general thoughts as we look out five to ten years? What you foresee happening within the the general silver market? Well, that's a, that's a really good question. Um... You know, and, and there's so many different ways to approach that question. You know, on on one hand, like looking at it from my vantage point, you know, being around mineral exploration, development and production for the last 20 years, um, I'm disappointed that as an industry, we're quite, we react. And, and what I mean by that is, um, and again, it's because we work for our shareholders, right? And so you've, you've got a situation that I've witnessed in the 20 years that I've spent in this business, but also studying, um, you know, you know, history. But it seems as though we react to price, right? So when the prices of different metals go up, we we focus more on those metals that are more economic. It sounds pretty you know, straightforward and, and practical, but the problem with that is what ends up happening is you, there's an under investment in exploration and development and building pipelines of future supply. So I don't think people really appreciate how fragile we are. And it's not just about silver. It actually hits on almost every commodity, but the setup, particularly for silver is is quite worrisome from a supply standpoint like last year we had about a 200 million ounce deficit in silver we're projected to have about a 250 million ounce deficit this year in 2023 and as different um, industrial applications, particularly the, the solar industry in, in the photovoltaics um, that's taking up a lot of uh, use for silver. I think right now we're at about 15% of all silver gets consumed by the solar industry, but that's up from 5% just a few years ago, and it's projected to go to 50% soon. So, you know, simply put, Half of all silver that's getting produced is going to get taken up by one industrial application. And the problem is this is happening at a time where we're seeing less silver produced on an annual basis. And the, and the most challenging part that's specific to silver is only 20% of silver comes from pure silver mines. So you can't just ramp it up. You, you know, it, you're, you're, you're uh, relying on byproducts, you know, from base metal mines. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you know, it's a very, very fragile. And, and that's why it makes it such an exciting and explosive investment opportunity. Um, because I do think we're going to see the, the shortage in the, in the market translate into some pretty big moves in price. Yeah. You know, and the, and the other thing um, that you didn't mention, but I, I hear from everyone is that, Mexico is the world's number one producer of silver. I think they, they contribute about 30% is what I've heard uh, most recently. And uh, from a jurisdictional perspective, Mexico is becoming a very difficult place uh, to, to explore, develop, or even run a mine right now. So if you add that into the mix uh, from a future supply perspective, it becomes even more challenging uh, for the industry to supply the 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 silver that's going to be demanded down the road. Um, well, on how- on that on that front, you're absolutely right. Um, and r- r- right now, um, the the politicians in Mexico have said no more open pit mines. 
you know, mm-hmm. there's, and so if you, you know, if you think about that for a moment, right, like there's, you know, open pit mining is not going to happen going forward in Mexico. That's a pretty concerning statement for silver production going forward. Um, and, and, and Mexico had other challenges leading up to this, you know, it's whether it's with the, with the drug traffickers, you know, security issues at different mines. Like there was a number of issues that were already plaguing Mexican mining companies. This is just another one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, just recently there were uh, armed bandits, I think, that uh, took on a was a Pan American silver mine and took some of their their concentrate away. So we're in this situation, and please correct me if I'm wrong. You're more of an expert on this than I am, but we're in this situation where we're forecasting uh, huge growth and demand for silver. The pipeline of new projects coming in is seems to be running quite dry. Uh, and because of market conditions, there's very little money being invested, generally speaking, into exploration and development for new uh, silver projects. Are you ahead of the curve? That we're, I guess we're here to talk about your company, Dolly, Vard, and Silver. When I, uh, as a shareholder, when I look at your company, I feel like you are, uh, and you used this word earlier, kind of proactively, strategically positioning the company to benefit from what appears to be, uh, you know, an oncoming, uh, a much more uh, agreeable market for silver producers. So when I, when I went looking for Dolly Varden, it was actually five years ago, um, back in 2018, I made a decision that I wanted to take a very, I wanted to get overweight silver um, as an investment. And I sought out uh, uh, and an opportunity specifically the Dolly Varden silver mine is in Canada and it's a high grade mine. And so when I came into the company, I, I took it over after doing a lot of due diligence. I took it over in uh, February of 2020. I took over as CEO. And what, what I've done with Dolly Varden is I've taken this project that when I took over was about a four, it was 40 million ounces of high grade silver in the ground in Canada, a safe jurisdiction, good grades. It was a past producer. Um, the next door neighbor to the, in terms of project was Hecla mining, which is America's number one silver producer sure. and soon to be Canada's. And so I thought if we could prove up enough metal in the ground, there may be an opportunity for a buyout in the future. Mm-hmm. And what we've done in three years is we've grown our resources in the ground from 40 million. We now have 140 million. So we've grown through making acquisitions. We've go- grown through retaining some of the top scientists. These are uh, the ex- exploration side geologists uh, who've made some pretty significant discoveries. But ultimately, my, my goal was to identify as much silver in the ground as possible, not to mine it today. And because I, if you look at the average silver producer today, they're not making money. Mm-hmm. First of all, there, there really is no such thing as a silver producer. All these silver companies are producing lead or zinc or gold or copper. And if they can produce 30% of their metal is silver. They call themselves a silver producer. So really there's very few, there, I, I, can, I really can't think of a real silver, pure silver miner. Um, and if there are, they're very, very small, it's tiny production. So my thinking was, look, we're, and these silver miners that are producing silver or silver um, byproduct, a silver equivalent, they're not making money. You know, the price of silver in, in the low 20s, they're all in sustaining costs in the low 20s. So it's a it's a break even. There's no incentive to develop. There's no incentive to explore. So my thinking was forget production, forget development. Let's grow resources because it's those resources that when I took over Dolly Varden were valued at 30 cents a silver ounce in the ground. Mm-hmm. I've witnessed in 2011 when the price of silver shot up to $49, um, and in other bull market cycles, those ounces in the ground will be worth 10 times what they were when I took over Dolly Varden. So my thinking was, look, I could actually sit on my hands and this company is going to be worth 10 times more than it was when I took it over. Or 
I could get to work growing the deposit through buying neighboring deposits and um, employing the smartest scientists in the business to make discoveries. Today, we're trading at almost a dollar an ounce in the ground. But again, it's that's only a fraction of where we will trade in a bull market. And so the goal here, the strategy is to build up a silver vault in the ground. And in the future, I think we'll get we'll get properly valued for for those ounces. Yeah, I like that. You, you took the words out of my mouth because I uh, that was one of the first things I did in pre preparation for this interview is I, I want to figure out. Uh, how much per ounce uh, the the per ounce of silver the company's valued at, and I came to about a dollar. And I like to tell people, you know, I love to own physical silver, but the next best thing to me is owning it in the ground in Canada uh, for a dollar an ounce. It's a it's a very uh, uh, attractive proposition. Well, you know, think think about this. Silver hasn't really moved much in the last couple of years since I took over Dolly Varden. But if you had invested in the company when I took over, you'd be up 300%. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is we've seen about a 300% increase to the number of ounces that we now have within the company. And if silver prices do move, you are now going to experience that in situ value or that per ounce value per share um, based not on 40 million ounces, but now on 140 and however many more we grow it to. Um, and so that's that's what's interesting. And and again, I'm, I'm also, and this is really important, Ron, it's not just about merely getting ounces in the ground. They need to be economic. They need to be mineable. If I was, if, if this was strictly just an exercise to try to get as many ounces, I would go for low grade, uneconomic ounces that I could never get to. But what's where's the value in that? So we've got a very, very high cutoff grade. So and, and again, we're we're specifically focused on ounces that we think we'll be able to mine in the future. I have a question for you. Let's hypothetically say we get to sixty dollars silver. Does that cutoff grade? Uh, does, does that threshold get lowered because obviously more? Okay. Yeah. okay. I don't think we'd have to wait till $60 silver. To lower <laughs> but, but no, you're absolutely right. Like I ran some sensitivity analysis in terms of price on our net asset value. And this is back when we only had 40 million ounces for every $5 increase in the price. So if we went to 20, you know, call it $27, $28 silver or $32. Like it is incredible. It is incredible. The easiest way to think about this is let's assume the average silver producer's cost is about $20 an ounce to mine. Right. Well, $23, you know, you're making $3 an ounce in every ounce you produce. If the price goes to 26, you're a hundred percent more profitable. So every $3 increase is it equates to a hundred percent profitability. And so if you talk about $60 silver um, and I, I'm in the camp that think we're going to see prices that exceed $60, but I'm building a business that is, it works in a $20 environment. Right. Yeah. With the optionality that if we get these much higher prices, it could be, and, it, and it's not just higher prices that could benefit your company, but it's this growth of the actual size of the resource as well. And you've been doing quite a bit of drilling, I understand. Uh, any any comments on that? Yeah. At different times, we've had different, you know, for example, so when the price of silver pulled back, you know, we like since I've been CEO of Dolly Varden, we've had silver prices range from $12 an ounce to $30 an ounce. When the price was, you know, when the silver price was low, we've gone out and made acquisitions. Mm -hmm. But right now, um, because of some breakthroughs on the discovery side, we've just completed the largest drill program the project's ever seen. So we just completed a 51,000 meter drill program and I've got about 40,000 meters. Like we're talking somewhere in the magnitude of a hundred drill holes to report to market. Wow. So, so news flow will be, uh, will be coming uh, in the, in the coming months. And, and again, this has been one of the few silver names that has grown in terms of the share price and the way we 
grown is through discoveries. So I'm about to put out, you know, that feed or that fodder in terms of to the market of continued growth. So these are the catalysts that should continue to drive our share price. Interesting. And you did an acquisition, was it a little over a year ago? And that added a, a gold resource as well? Yeah, you know, I, yeah. So the other, the, the one element that we have that's not pure high grade silver is we have about a million ounces of gold. Um, and again, for me, you know, that, you know, if I, if I, if I had to be in any metals, they would be silver and gold. So I'm giving our shareholders exposure to pr uh, pr precious metal gold ounces. And the nice thing about that is if we were to go through a time, a turbulent time, a major recession, a depression, what I've found is silver could go down. You know, silver's industrial attributes um, shine brightly when we're going through a turbulent time, and often silver goes down in price, whereas I find gold was going to insulate our shareholders from volatility. And we've already seen that and so i really believe gold works in both deflation and inflation and i'm, I'm really proud that we've insulated our shareholders with that large high-grade gold resource but what's interesting about dolly varden is it's the only company that's out there that has this size of both silver and gold at these grades so it's size meets grade in a safe jurisdiction in a safe jurisdiction in the golden triangle, which for those of our viewers that don't know, this is considered to be one of the most prolific mining districts in the world. Is that, is that an accurate statement? Yeah. Like the golden triangle, the history of the golden triangle goes back to eight, the 1860s. And if you go back at a time where, you know, you didn't have any of the new technologies you know, you had glaciers and ice covered the area. Um, it's an area that mining operations were quite profitable um, at mm -hmm. different times throughout history, through the 1920s, through the 1950s. What's really interesting is up until 1989 in the Golden Triangle, collectively, there, there had been about 5 million ounces of gold discovered. We've added about 150 million ounces of gold discovery. Um, in the last 30 years. And that's through the advent of some infrastructure, gl glaciers retreating. There's been about a billion ounces of silver discovered in the Golden Triangle. And, you know, my question that I have for Dolly Varden, you know, when I first took over, we had 40 million ounces in the ground. The question was, could we get to 100? Well, we blew through 100, right? We're at 140. The next question is, can my property host a billion ounce discovery there's a billion ounces outside of our borders can our project also host a big high grade system and and ron maybe we never get there maybe we only get to 300 million or perhaps we can push it to 500 million but um but that that's what we're going for uh and it, and it sounds like you uh of course can't predict the future but you you feel confident that with the team of geologists that you have with your knowledge of the property package that you have that it's very likely uh that you will see some some rather significant growth uh, in terms of your resource size as we go into the next 5 years well what's interesting is since we've put out our resource estimates which actually go back to 2019 um, we've done about a hundred thousand meters of drilling and we already have shown significant growth. So those numbers I'm quoting you are very conservative. They're understated. They have grown. Um, but yeah, based on what we're seeing through the drill results, um, and what we know about the area, we feel very confident there's like, this is, this is a growth story. And if we didn't believe it was, if we didn't believe that we would be moving towards development and moving mm -hmm. towards production. But we think that um, there's a lot more to discover and that's why we're still focused. And I think the greatest value creation for a mining company is exploration. Yeah. You know, for other companies who are trying to replace mineral inventory or grow resources, acquisitions can be quite expensive. If you have the ability to grow through exploration, it could be quite cost-effective. Yeah, it, it 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 feels like to me, especially at, for a silver specific company right now, the most strategic 
uh, use of capital, uh, it would be to explore, uh, especially if you're having success with the uh, with the drill bit. Um, you, so you did the acquisition and uh, Homestake Ridge, and and added that to your current property. Uh, and there's there's this prospect that between the two there could be even more mineral mineralization. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, I, I have to take you back a few years to before the acquisition. So you had these two separate projects, mm -hmm. and you had a border that was between the two projects, and neither company had the incentive to explore close to the border. We didn't okay. want to add value to Homestake, and Homestake didn't want to add value to Dolly. However, there are some tremendous targets that were right on the border, and there's this idea of paradicity or it's a repeating pattern. So you've got four deposits in the South and three in the North, and these deposits occur every mile. Every mile, there's another major deposit. There's these cross-cutting faults along this trend. Now, there's about a five and a half kilometer gap in between the deposits in that boundary zone. And so we we suspect we could fit three major deposits in that area, taking our total from seven to 10. And um, we're starting to move our way into that boundary zone. And we're starting to drill some targets like the moose target and others that are in that gap zone. And we'll, we'll wait to, you know, we're uh, anxiously waiting and we're cautiously optimistic to see the drill results um, and, and to validate that theory. Interesting. Uh, you know, another thing that I discovered while I was researching your company is what I would call maybe one of the most impressive uh, investor rosters out there. Uh, am I correct in that only maybe seven or eight percent of the outstanding shares are held by retail investors and the rest were major corporations, famous billionaire investors, other. Can you comment on that a little bit? Yeah. And, and I really think like this is the foundation we've built Dolly Varden on, right? And it's a solid foundation. So we've got eight shareholders or so that control about 90% of the company. So this is a billionaire investor, Eric Sprott. This is a mining company in Hecla Mining. So not only is Hecla the neighboring company, but they're also a 10% shareholder and they're mining this metal and they've been acquisitive. They've made a couple of acquisitions in the neighborhood uh, within the last 12 months. Um, so in addition to Eric Sprott at 10% and Hecla at 10%, you've got um, institutional investors that own 50% of the company. And I think, you know, these institutions employ analysts and they employ experts and ex-miners and geologists to do their due diligence. So you've got a high degree of due diligence that's been done both by the mining company and the institutions. And then you've got a publicly traded company in Fury Gold Mines that owns 23%. So you have alignment. Like I've got a particular vision and, and, and strategy and these investors I would say the most astute precious metals investors on the planet have bought into that vision. And it's one of the reasons that our share price has done pretty good in a sideways silver tape. Um, and it's because we've got real shareholders that they're, they're not here for a quick flip. They're, they're here to build a business. They understand how, how you know, how this works and they understand how rare and, and how special what we have is that it is high grade silver in a safe jurisdiction and how, you know, most of the silver doesn't come from primary silver mines like the Dolly Varden mine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting, you know, the amount of silver that your company has and, uh, and I compliment you on your ability to have grown that resource during your time there. In Canada, uh, in a safe jurisdiction that's accessible, and what I hear from a lot of the other silver mining CEOs, the producers right now, is uh, is that they can't find projects, right? There's no, There are no projects out there. So it's just such a unique opportunity and just my opinion, I'm not giving financial advice to anyone right now, but to be in this position where there's been, a, 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 for lack of a better way to describe it, almost like a negative confluence of market factors to give investors an opportunity to buy into uh, a, a, an asset that is strategically placed 
uh, to to really benefit over the next five to 10 years. Of course, none of us have a crystal ball, but it just feels like with this pipeline of new silver projects running so dry, with the geopolitical risk that's going on in the world, which is making uh, you know the jurisdiction so much more important that you've really positioned this company to, um, you know, in my opinion, minimal downside risk, but some real explosive upside risk. Uh, if either you continue to find, you know, hundreds of thousands uh, or millions of more ounces of silver, and or if the silver price were to, you know, get to where a lot of us think it should be. Ron, I'm I'm really conservative. I my, I have ambitions to find tens of millions of more ounces. Yeah. And I think what validates what you're saying in terms of how rare. So if you're an investor and and you 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 do your homework and you realize that there is a silver deficit, right? And there's you know growing uses and you've got all the the monetary setup for both gold and silver is really bullish. Um, and then you go okay, so you can buy physical. Mm -hmm. physical and if, and if you're right and the price shoots up to 60 you know you've got close to triple your money right but what we've seen from the silver miners from the silver equities is the leverage is like 300 percent to the price of silver so you, i would suspect that if you're seeing you know 300 percent appreciation on the metal you're going to see a 900 percent appreciation in the equities um now, once you start going through the list, how do you play this? You can go and you can buy a silver royalty company, but guess what? There isn't any. You know, the, the silver wheat is now wheat and precious metals because they've got all this exposure to gold and other metals. So the, you, there is no silver royalty company. The silver producers, there is no pure silver producer. The closest thing you have is heckle mining, and that's why there's has done really well over the last couple of years because they're in safe jurisdictions and they're you know they have a they're a primary silver producer so you've got you've got a shortage of choices on the producers and then there really are very little there's just a handful of developers um and then on the exploration side i can only think of three companies we're one of three companies that are that are giving investors exposure to growing silver resources so it's a short list. And that's why I believe when money comes into the space and it's it's we're already starting to see the, the beginnings of it, um, th this space is going to be explosive. Yeah, but like uh, I've heard that saying, trying to drain Hoover Dam with a drinking straw. There's just not, you know, the window's not big enough for all the all the people that are, are going to want to get in. Uh, I really enjoy uh, or really have enjoyed talking to you and appreciate all the information you've shared with us today and our viewers as well, Sean. Is there anything I missed? Anything uh, about the company that I that I forgot to ask you about? No, I think I think you've got it all. The, the one thing I just just want to add is we are also in the silver ETFs. So the okay. SIL, the SILJ. So when Again, when the price of silver goes up and more money goes to own a basket of silver stocks, we're in there. So we will get an allocation as more money comes into the space. And that's really important as we, we're in this world of passive investing. And uh, the fact that we're in an ETF, I think, really also differentiates us from our peers. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, I know that's quite quite a, a, a designation and helpful, as like you said, when capital comes back in. I will have the uh, stock ticker symbols both for, for the USA and Canada on the screen. Uh, and if people want to learn more about the company, uh, dollyvardensilver.com. Is that correct? That's correct. And we're, we're active on, on Twitter um, or on X at, at Silver Varden. And, uh, you know, on our website, there's lots of contact information. If you want to call us or email us, we love talking to shareholders. All right. Well, thank you, Sean. And, uh, uh, you know, I, on behalf of myself and, and our viewers, again, thank you for your time and your insight into the company, but also the general silver market. It's a super, in my opinion, exciting time to be invested in the silver industry, and uh, I'll. Uh, well, it'll be fun to watch as uh, as Dolly Varden continues to grow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ron.